Today's broadcast is brought to you by viewers like you. Become a member today and unlock exclusive content at patreon.com slash northstarradio. Every day as you exist on Earth, you maneuver around pieces of the world that were built, but not by you. They may have been paid by small bits of money leaving your bi-weekly paycheck, but the actual construction and maintenance of said infrastructure is hidden from you. Your environment is not in your power or in your field of view. And it's not just roads. America is generally a mountainous country. So when valleys and waterways appear, bridges are required. Massive machines of steel and concrete are molded to hold itself and tons more in weight. Every day, the top 10 busiest bridges in America carry 11,305,400 people safely across waterways. Over 11 million people every day have to trust that the bridge they're crossing over won't collapse from beneath them. America is the most powerful, most most wealthy country in the history of the world. Yet sometimes, bridges fail. In the upper Midwest, the part of the country that's home to the entire cereal, cheese, and steel industry is also home to something else water. The Great Lakes account for 21% of the world's fresh water, and a place in the Midwest known for its water is Minnesota. The word Minnesota means sky-tinted water. The biggest city in sky-tinted water is City of Waters, or Minneapolis. This is me, at age six, standing on the Stone Arch Bridge. And one week before this photo was taken, on August 1st, 2007, during rush hour traffic, the I-35W bridge carrying 140,000 vehicles daily collapsed beneath itself. We're following a very serious story right now. Just a few moments ago, we found out there was a bridge collapse in Minneapolis. Apparently, on University Avenue and 35W, it appears the bridge that goes over 35W has collapsed. Uh, we understand there are several people and cars in the water, and the people are injured. Seemingly, nothing caused it. Not a boat or some sort of explosion. It simply failed. Clearly at age six years old, I wasn't exactly aware of the full extent of what just occurred. But to this day, every time I pass over the newly constructed I-35W bridge, something I do incredibly often, I can't help but imagine, what if the bridge collapsed right now? And the collapse isn't the only thing I worry about. If you've ever driven across the I-35W bridge, you may have noticed that the guardrails in between you and a 115 foot drop are extremely short and dainty. And although the bridge is fitted with an ice melting system, I can't help but imagine myself falling off the side every time I cross it in the winter. 13 people died that day, 145 injured, and an entire state traumatized. In an effort to make sure this never happens again and to comfort the rest of the state's population, over the next 10 years, the state of Minnesota spent $2 billion to repair 172 structurally deficient bridges. Unsurprisingly, thanks to these precautionary measures, no bridge has collapsed in Minnesota since August 1st, 2007. But unfortunately, not every state took these precautionary measures. As on March 26, 2024, at 1.28 a.m., thank God, the Francis Scott Key Bridge collapsed. We are tracking breaking news in Baltimore right now where a massive bridge has completely collapsed and you see it happen right there. This wow. is after it was struck by a large container ship. Right now, divers and search and rescue teams are still looking for people who fell into the water. The Francis Scott Key Bridge is a fairly new bridge in the scale of American history. One of the most famous American bridges, the Brooklyn Bridge, spanning the East River between Brooklyn and Manhattan, was built 141 years ago in a 1883. The Stone Arch Bridge, the most famous bridge in Minnesota, is even older. Built in 1881, this bridge once carried train cars full of grain, now limited to bikes and pedestrians. The Francis Scott Key Bridge was built only 52 years ago, in 1972. The bridge spans 8,636 feet, or 1.6 miles, overall carrying 11.5 million people every year. The Francis Scott Key Bridge is an incredibly important bridge for Baltimore, causing this freak accident to not only affect users of the bridge, but also the entire economy economy of Baltimore, as now the entirety of the city's ports are blocked by the collapsed bridge. But here's the thing, 
this was not a freak accident. A key aspect of what makes for a freak accident is its unavoidability. This particular accident occurred when a 300 meter long cargo ship lost power while attempting to leave the Baltimore Harbor. The power loss caused the boat to lose steering abilities and drift into a support pier holding the bridge. However, the support pier should have never been accessible to the cargo ship in the first place. If you look at this photo, the structure directly next to the bridge is a set of pylons transporting electricity across the river. The structures seen at the base of these pylons are precautionary. These structures are called dolphins, and they're meant to protect important pieces of infrastructure when a boat collision inevitably occurs. And while the electricity these pylons are supplying is deemed an important piece of infrastructure, a 1.6 mile long bridge carrying 11.5 million people a year was not deemed important enough to enact these precautionary measures. You can see those circular structures from Drone 6. And when you look at video from Baltimore, you don't see them near the support piers, something a structural engineering professor at Drexel noticed right away. Why were there no protection systems around the pier. Why is it that in the richest, most powerful country in the history of the world, these oversights and the safety of our population are all too common? High-speed trains, car-free neighborhoods, brand new cities. The world is rapidly developing and the United States is falling behind. China has surpassed the United States as the largest economy in the world. China is going to eat our lunch Come on, man. Since 2008, the Chinese government has built 25,000 miles of high-speed rail, drastically changing the landscape and economy of the working class. Do you want to take a guess as to how many miles of high-speed rail the United States has built ever? You'd be right to assume that it's less than China. Maybe something like 15,000? Or maybe they have way more than us and we have something like 2,000? I don't know. What if I told you the number is not 5,000? It's not 2,000. It's not even 1,000. We have only 500 miles of high-speed rail. One of the wealthiest and most populated countries, featuring incredibly dense East Coast and Midwest population centers, has only 500 miles of high-speed rail. What if I told you I lied? The United States of America doesn't have 500 miles of high-speed rail. The United States of America has only 50 miles of high-speed rail. Without making this point take too much time, I need to talk just a little bit about car dependency. The fact that we don't have reliable train travel in the United States of America isn't by accident. The majority of Americans would be shocked to learn that really no matter how big your city is, as long as it's categorized as a city, it likely still has streetcar tracks. They're just a few inches under the asphalt of your main street. Massive streetcar networks like the network once here in the Twin Cities, used to sprawl all over the United States. Incredible pieces of machinery that allowed US cities to grow and flourish. But with the invention and popularization of the automobile coinciding with the end of World War II, America changed drastically. Here are your keys. Oh boy, what music to the ears. What beautiful words. What wonderful words, you know? That could be you. Yes, sir, that could be you riding off in that brand new Chevrolet. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Hold everything. It could be you. It could be me. Look, what I want to know is when do I get my Chevrolet? A combination of newly found wealth, machinery, and racism caused mass numbers of white people to leave American cities. The streetcar companies were bought and turned to bus companies by the automobile industry as the concept of a well-defined walkable city was gutted in the name of freedom. Post-World War II, the concept of owning a house and an automobile or two was advertised as the epitome of freedom, as we began to design our cities around what a car needed to operate, not a human being. You and I live in a period of tremendous growth with many problems. Across the United States, new homes are springing up by the thousands for our rapidly growing population. Because we are an industrial nation, most of the people must live in urban areas. The growth of these regions presents one of the biggest challenges facing our nation. The problem of urban sprawl. The vast sea of houses created by this explosion of the urban population flows outward in endless waves, 
The automobile is an important factor in the spread of urban areas. Traveling over modern highways, people can escape from the crowded cities and move outward in search of open space to build their homes and raise their families. One subdivision after another leapfrogs across the landscape competing for valuable land space. Even going as far as to use a highway development project as a tool for wiping out entire black neighborhoods. Rondo was torn apart in the late 1950s by the construction of I-94. 600 homes, 300 businesses leveled. All to make room for the freeway. Some businesses that rebuilt didn't survive. The students learned about what happened in the Rondo community by interviewing those who remember. They produced a documentary called Rondo, Beyond the Pavement. When I saw the pictures of the devastation, my soul wept. Cars aren't freedom. They're an idea of freedom, even though they lock you into one option of transportation. We're so far gone into the mess that cars have caused that in most parts of the country, you are forced to buy a car. You have no choice. No one likes being forced to own a car and use it as much as they do. This is proven by the fact that thousands of Americans travel to cities all over the world that are not designed for cars. Even if they don't realize, these cities feel special because you have more options than just a car, and the city is designed to optimize that. Here in America, the environment is optimized for cars only. If you want to walk, there's no sidewalk. If you want to take the bus, which hopefully your city has one, and if it does, its bus stop is probably on the side of a highway like this one. Want to ride your bike? Well, there's no bike lane. You have to share the road with massive hunks of metal. And even if there were bike lanes, the American city is designed as such that there's nowhere that you can adequately bike to in a reasonable amount of time. You need to own a car. But even though car infrastructure is the only transportation infrastructure the US government has to focus on, they still can't get it right. On November 6, 2021, Congress passed the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act, which would invest over $300 billion in repairing and rebuilding America's roads and bridges. That's pretty cool. It's the largest investment since President Eisenhower's investment in the interstate highway system. That was 1956. The last time we spent this much money investing in our infrastructure. And we spent more back then. For comparison, the US government spent $766 billion on national defense. Not since 2000, not since 2005, in 2019 alone. And even when we do spend that much money, it doesn't even do the job, as seen by what happened in Baltimore. Remember that statistic I brought up at the beginning of this video? Every day, the top 10 busiest bridges in the country bring 11,305,400 people safely across waterways. Those aren't the top 10 busiest bridges in the country. Those are the top 10 busiest structurally deficient bridges in the country. 11,305,400 people every day cross over structurally deficient bridges and have to hope and pray that this time around crossing the bridge, it won't collapse from beneath them. Hello, this is Casey from the future because I have an important clarification to make. So the source I used to get that data for the amount of people that travel over structurally deficient bridges every day is from this table. And for whatever reason, when I was doing research, I, I looked at it completely wrong. So I was only looking at one of these but this is basically ranked by metros by size. Metros 500,000 to 1 million, metros 1 to 2 million, and metros that are over 2 million. I only looked at one of these. So if you look at all three tables, which are already limited to the 10 biggest metros in this uh, frame of population, you get 108 million people traveling over structurally deficient bridges every day. Is that not absolutely insane? All right, now that I got that confusion cleared up, back to the video. Infrastructure in America is clearly an afterthought, as the capitalist-run government is more interested in making money than making a better society. So when we look at an accident like the one that happened in Baltimore, it's quite obvious who's at fault. DEI hires. 
DEI, or Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion, is a framework that seeks to promote the fair treatment and full participation of all people, particularly groups who have historically been underrepresented or subject to discrimination on the basis of identity or disability. And when the cargo ship ran into the Francis Scott Key Bridge causing its collapse, many people were quick to say the lack of white men caused it. This is what happens when you have governors who prioritize diversity over the well-being and security of citizens. This is Baltimore's DEI mayor commenting on the collapsed Francis Scott Key Bridge. DEI is a betrayal of art. DEI has seemingly become a way for shy racist people to use the incredibly dehumanizing word used against black people. This is incredibly racist and unacceptable. And I am not at all trying to defend people that say this. But this is caused by inherent contradictions in capitalism that go unaddressed. Americans know that life here isn't as easy as you're made to believe. And as you go through life, your voice is never cared about or listened to. You work incredibly hard, working three jobs to support your family but it's never enough. You can never get out of the paycheck to paycheck cycle. And God forbid you get sick or injured causing thousands in medical bills. The American dream doesn't seem any more real even as a fifth generation American. In an article by Hader Khan, a professor of economics at the University of Denver, he explained, during times of capitalist expansion, prompted by class struggles that acquire anti-racist and anti-sexist dimensions, racism and sexism may retreat somewhat. The state itself becomes a contested territory. This is the history of post-World War II capitalism in its social democratic forms until the early 1970s. Gain made by anti-racist and anti-patriarchal movements, limited as they were, can still be understood as real advances from this perspective. However, with the development of crisis tendencies from the 1970s onward, the neoliberal strategy of privatization and market liberalization undermined the social democratic structure. Sociological racist theories are on the rise, along with sociobiological and sociocultural variants, largely because of the multifaceted global global crises of capitalism revealed ever more intensely since the global depression of 2008. Today, we face perhaps the deepest global set of capitalist and imperialist crises since the beginning of the history of capitalism. Inevitably, various forms of racist and patriarchal theories and practices are coming to the fore. There's a reason why fascism always rises out of hardship. Germany experienced a brutal loss in World War I followed by an even more devastating Great Depression. And we all know what happened next. There's a reason why racist sentiment is ramping up in the United States. People can tell our system sucks. Bridges fail. Life isn't as easy here as we're made to believe. An unexplainable contradiction in our capitalist society is easily explained by our government and to the American working class with race. We see that more and more in today's America. A capitalist state in decay turning to fascism. To eradicate systemic racial ideology that underpins fascist racism today, it is necessary more and more to overcome and negate the commodification of labor power itself. Thank you for watching North Star Radio. Peace and love and free Palestine.